www.ebbsfarms.com or call today to set up your appointment 352-615-5566. All right, five minutes after nine o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Forty degrees here right now, a little bit, a little bit cooler than what we normally brag about in Florida, right? But but it's a lot warmer than other places, right? This is really a beautiful place. I mean, just look out the window. The skies are blue, right? You go take a little drive. We got one of the most beautiful rivers in the world, right? Oh yeah. Can gorgeous. you can you imagine? Can you imagine if all of a sudden po- the political climate changed so that you didn't you wouldn't even want to live here? I know. I, I mean, this is happening to some places in this world. That it, it's just so upsetting. Some, I, you know, my grandmother and grandfather left Germany because it was a mess. And, and they would always talk about this beautiful place, and I've never gone there. But I guess it's back to being a beautiful place. Yeah. And so let's, let's see if we can make some other places that once were beautiful and really, in all in, for all purposes, are beautiful, except for the political climate, Afghanistan being the one specifically that we're going to talk about. On the phone is a gentleman who knows Afghanistan better than I ever will. <laughs> yeah. Better than most of us ever will. Uh, Abdullah Sharif is on the phone. He wrote this book called Sardar, From Afghanistan's Golden Age to Carnage. Uh, his credentials are outstanding. He is an aviation engineer. He served as a peace diplomat who worked with the United States State Department and the U.S. Department of Defense from 2009 to 2014 to rebuild Afghanistan. And 2014 was just um, two months ago, wasn't it? So yes. he's probably still involved with this, I'm sure. And and we have a very short interview, so uh, let's get as much information as possible. Abdullah Sharif. Good morning, Abdullah. Good morning to you. Thank you for being on the air with us. Where are you right now? I'm in beautiful Naples, Florida. Oh, yay! <laughs> He's warmer than us. <laughs> can, can, can you can you get to... So. <laughs> do, do you have family in Afghanistan right now? No, I don't. No, my uh, I'm here, and my mother lives in Germany, and we are all over the world, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, what are, what are you doing specifically to help out Afghanistan? What what's going on? Uh, well, I right now I'm not. I'm just writing the books. And I'm okay. writing my second book now. But, okay. Uh, but I uh, went to Afghanistan and actually tried to uh, build the bridges between the U.S. and and Afghans, and because of the knowledge of the culture and language i was uniquely positioned to serve the, the mission and so that's what i did yeah what, what, what do you think about our efforts to help out over there do are they working well yes and no uh obviously we had to go to afghanistan to uh, defeat the taliban al-qaeda types but i think what ensued afterwards i think that we kind of took our eyes off the ball and we went to Iraq and we did not have enough resources and forces to really do the right job in Afghanistan. So we allied ourselves with the bad people, the warlords who are now entrenched within the government and who are the ones who uh, uh, perpetuate this uh, system of uh, impunity, this culture of impunity and, and corruption. Um, it, we, we hear the, the, the message that this, this is religious. That the, is, that, is that absolutely true, or is it more about money? What, what, is there something underlying that we don't know? Well, you know, obviously, religion is not the main reason, but religion is obviously used as a tool to what uh, I think. do whatever people want to do, exactly. And the problem in Afghanistan is just really political, because if you, as I've written in my book, uh, you know, the golden age of Afghanistan, these religious sects existed, the tribal uh, affiliations existed, the ethnic groups existed, but why was Afghanistan the way it was? I mean, you know, roughly between 1930-1975, uh, although Afghanistan, modern Afghanistan was established in 1747. So, uh, you know, it just has to do with how inclusive the uh, government is, and that is really the, the, uh, the problem. So do, do we see any hope this year? Do we see any hope in 10 years? What, what is the, the, the outlook? Is there, is there a positive light at the end of the tunnel? I hate to be, the, you know, to be pessimistic. Of course, I'm optimistic, but we have to be also realistic. It has taken Afghanistan 30 years to descend to this abyss, and it's going to take mm. probably at least three generations to come out of it, because destroying is easy. Rebuilding is much more difficult. Three generations. When it comes to the changing, yeah, and th- especially in terms of uh, uh, changing people's mentality and their way of uh, thinking and so forth. And uh, you are one of the best pe- people to be an ambassador for good. Uh, your dad served in the Afghan military. 
Yes, and that was one of the reasons that I went back there because when I looked at uh, when I look back at the Afghanistan's golden age, it is people like my father, my uncles, a lot of fat Afghans of different walks of life who were educated, patriotic, and who built that and sustained that that society. And, and so I thought that I'd just go back at least try. Of course, my efforts were just a small drop in a huge bucket, but at, at least you know I, I was able to do something for some Afghans and for us as well for the, for the U.S. The, the book is called Sardar. What is, the, what is the title? What is Sardar? Sardar is the aristocratic title of my family, the Muhammad Zais, who ran Afghanistan for 200 years uh, since the inception of Af- modern Afghanistan in 1747. And when I went back to Afghanistan, people who found out about my affiliation, they would call me that, although I don't use, this, the, I don't use the title. But the reason for it is because the Sardars or the Muhammad Zais had left a legacy and that legacy needed to be told because it's important for the Afghans and for the other ones as well um, to realize that Afghanistan was a beautiful place at one time, as you mentioned yourself before. Yeah, and and so uh, three generations seems like an awfully long time. It, it didn't. It didn't take three generations for Germany to get back on track. Why? Why? Why three generations? Because the devastation in Afghanistan is much more profound than Germany. The, Germany went through the war. But education was still there, people were still educated, mm. and so they picked up the pieces and moved forward. And I thought also Germany was a more homogeneous society than Afghanistan is. And, uh, and unfortunately, these people who are in power right now, they are exploiting these, these faults uh, along tribal uh, you know, affiliations and, and ethnic and so forth to perpetuate there. So it's, the picture is a lot more complicated than in Germany. This is, this is maybe just my simple-mindedness showing here, but is it possible that the young people will be the ones to change it because of the fact that they can communicate so easily now with the social media? And I know it sounds superficial and dumb, but, but I've, I've often wondered if yeah, young... If it, actually, this is, you're making a very good point. Actually, you're making a very good point. And my hope is also that the younger people would be tired of these bad people with the social media and their capabilities can do something. But unfortunately, uh, there are very few educated young people in Afghanistan. And education is something that can actually you know, free you from some of those misconceptions or whatever things that tie you for, to the past. And so, uh, so, yes, there's a hope for that, but at the same time, it's a, it's a, it's a ways to go. Do more of the people that can make a difference uh, in Afghanistan who live there, are they moving out so they can get themselves and their family better educated, and then are they planning to return to help heal? Well, it, you have got, yeah, you've got some people who have gone back, but there are people who, have, who are also trying to get out of Afghanistan because they don't see uh, you know, any, any hope in the near future. Um, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is, is that the, there are some good educated Afghans who tried to go back after we went to Afghanistan, but the people who are in charge, they didn't want them because, you know, educated Afghans and people who want to do the right things are a challenge to the establishment, and so they were marginalized. They couldn't really work. They couldn't do much there. That's why I went through the U.S. government, because I, what I saw there, I just couldn't believe it. I didn't want to be part of that anyway. Uh, are, are we? Uh, do, do you sometimes look at the news or listen to the news and uh, think to yourself that a lot of politicians are just issuing lip service? That just it's all words and and they're not doing the right things. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, just, you know, uh, Tom O'Neill one, one time said, you know, all politics is local. So a lot of stuff that people are saying, you know, yeah. they have got you know something uh, in their mind back home. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's part of the democracy we live in, and so there are good things for it, but at the same time, you know, as you just pointed out, uh, yeah, people just sometimes pay lip service. And it, it, it must have been extremely difficult for you to write the book because you've got so many wonderful memories about being there and about growing up there and then going back to see the devastation that uh, took place. How did you keep everything balanced? Well, you're absolutely right. It's, you know, writing a book is a difficult thing to do, and, you know, I'm not a writer anyway. I'm an engineer. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it brought, it brought out, uh, you know, out a lot of, uh, a lot of emotions. And, uh, uh, but, again, at the same time, um, I thought that the book would serve a good purpose, hopefully, and, and so that's what kept me going. Uh, Abdullah Sharif, thank you so much for being on the air with us. Do you want to give us a website? Uh, yes, my website is sardarbook.com. It's S A R D A R 
B O O K dot com. Okay. And one can find information about the past and so forth on there. As well. well, and we'll have to do this off the air. If you want the book that was sent to us by Abdullah, you can call me and, and get the one copy that was sent to us. The rest of us have to go buy it. I'm guessing it's all 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 the bookstores and all the booksellers. Uh, Sardarbook dot com is again the website. Yeah. Um, well, good luck with your book tour. Good luck with your writing. If you're ever in Ocala. Stop in and be That's a guest. Right. Be a guest in the studio. <laughs> yeah, happy to. Uh, happy to. Abdullah, thank you. thank you for what you're doing. I, I actually think that guys like you are making the world a better place, and it, it is. Edu- you're educating us. I mean, if we're educated, you know, I mean, it, it helps too. I think mm-hmm. be- the more we know, the better we are. So, thank, thank you, Abdullah. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. All right, you're we'll, welcome. We'll, we'll take thank a little. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back. Are you tired of looking through glasses with scratched lenses? Or are your frames a little dated? Well, Ocala Eye is offering a sweetheart special that can solve that problem today. Now, through the end of February, Ocala Eye is celebrating Valentine's Day every day by knocking $100 off on any complete pair of frames and lenses purchased from any of Ocala Eye's five locations, including the villages. Pick from hundreds of designer frames like Kate Spade, Coach, Vera Wang, Maui Jim, and more. Then apply the Ocala Eye Sweetheart Special and knock $100 off whatever the cost. And if you live in the villages, don't miss our Optical Trunk Show at our office on Laurel Manor Drive on Saturday, February 28th. For more information, go to OcalaEye.com. Trusted doctors and proven technology. Just another way Ocala Eye is looking out for you. Guy Harvey Checking is now exclusively available at Gateway Bank. With Guy Harvey Checking, you will receive Gateway's premium checking account, plus several other Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation features, including membership to the Guy Harvey Hammerhead Nation, free Guy Harvey t-shirt, and an exclusive... 